First of all, I want to thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. I'm Professor Malo Hudson. I'm a professor of urban planning here and also the director of the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. Uh, we hopefully will have a wonderful panel discussion and presentation by Professor Jason Corver. And I want it to be very interactive, so we hope to talk for about an hour or so and then we take questions from the audience. I know it's a very interesting and diverse crowd, with people with wonderful experience. So we really want to encourage you to uh, share that experience with us today. And let's really have a dialogue. Um, before I get started with my official remarks, I do want to thank uh, all the people who made this event possible. Um, Paul Amatai in the back from the Dean's office, I want to thank you for all of the hard work that you've done to make this possible. I have lots of emails with the panelists and so forth. And of course, uh, all of the D GSAP Dean's office staff who worked on this. So uh, we want to thank you very much for that. Again, I'm, I'm Professor Malo Hudson. I, I direct the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. And the real focus of the lab, which was launched in November of 2017, so very new. Um, I also just arrived here from Berkeley in August, so I'm also a faculty member here. Uh, but the lab's focus is really to break down the silos that we often see in academia. So to connect with architecture and planning and policy and public health and sociology and on and on, engineering to really address some of the most complex issues that our society faces today. As you know, I don't have to tell you, it's very depressing, but we have forced, forced migration. I just returned from the Middle East where you have literally hundreds of thousands of people who are being displaced with no housing, no water, no supplies. Uh, we have an environmental crisis, the issues around climate change, the housing crisis. You see, see I'm, I'm depressing professor for my students. I just go on about all the problems. Um, but I can go on and on. You all know this. And the real question is not what are the problems, but how do we solve those problems? Right? And I was trained um, in a way that says to solve some of the most complex problems, you need to talk to the people who have solutions to those problems at the community level, at the state level, at the international level, neighborhood residents, and so forth. You can learn from everyone. And so the idea is that this would be an opportunity, opportunity for us to get together today to discuss some of the experience that we have um, as, as scholars, practitioners, um, working at the local level, all the way into the, to the global level. The Urban Community Health Equity Lab really has three areas of focus. The first is the built environment and natural environment. The second is community and economic development. And the third is law and governance. Um, you know, I try to, we just try to include everything in there. But actually, we have some uh, lines of research, and I will talk about, in my case today, about some food systems work I'm doing in the state of California with colleagues. So with that said, let me just shift gears, and I want to introduce our moderator for today's uh, panel, Justin Garrett Moore. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that Justin has a twin because he just returned <laughs> from the Canary Islands on what, Tuesday night, yeah. just before the storm. We had a short conversation Wednesday, and he said, don't worry, Mom, I'll, I'll give questions to the panelists. So I didn't hear from Justin you know, Wednesday, I realized he's sleeping. <laughs> didn't hear from him yesterday, he's, he's adjusting. And we wake up, and Justin sends nine paragraphs of questions. Nine paragraphs of questions. So you get the point. Justin's a wonderful colleague of mine. Uh, he's an adjunct associate professor of architecture at Columbia GSAP. Uh, he teaches in urban design and urban planning. He is an urban designer and the executive director of the New York City Public Design Commission. He has ex extensive experience in urban design and city planning, from large-scale urban systems, policies, and projects, to grassroots, community-focused planning, design, arts, initiatives. Um, I won't go on and on into his bio, but he's a fantastic person. He is also the, the co-founder of the Urban Patch, of Urban Patch, I should say, a social enterprise based in Indianapolis, Indianapolis that focuses on community revitalization, design in American inner cities. His professional affiliations include the American Institute of Certified Planners, the Urban Design Forum, and Next Cities Vanguard. He also serves as a board member of IABI.org, Mary Miss City as Living Laboratory, and Made in Brownsville. So thank you very much, Justin. Welcome. Now I have the pleasure of introducing uh, today's keynote speaker, Professor Jason Corbett. Uh, I've known Jason for a long time. We were classmates at MIT together, classmates and colleagues, I guess colleagues at Berkeley, literally our offices were next door to each other. 
and I came from his uh, research lab, the Institute of Urban and Regional Development, where we really try to build a lot across the Berkeley campus and elsewhere. Uh, Jason Corburn is a professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning and the School of Public Health. He directs the Institute of Urban and Regional Development, which has been around since 1962, and the Center for Global Healthy Cities at UC Berkeley. He also coordinates the Joint Master of City Planning and Master of Public Health degree program at UC Berkeley. His research focuses on the links between environmental health and social justice in cities, notions of expertise in science-based policymaking, and the role of local knowledge in addressing environmental and public health problems. Professor Corbin is currently a leader of the Richmond Health Equity Partnership, a coalition that includes the city of Richmond, California, the Contra Costa County Public Health Department, West County Unified School District, and a number of nonprofit organizations, all working to reduce health inequities in Richmond. Professor Carl Corbin also leads a co-leads a participatory planning team working to improve the lives of residents and the informal settlements of Nairobi, Kenya. He has numerous books, including Street Science, Community Knowledge and Environmental Health, Justice, which won the 2007 Paul Davidoff Best Book Award from the Association, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning. He is also the author of Toward the Healthy City, Healthy City Planning, Healthy Cities, Crit uh, Critical Concepts in the Built Environment, and his most recent book, Slum Health, From Cell to the Street. As you can see, he's quite productive. He also is one of the uh, top teachers at Berkeley. Uh, he's the winner of the 2016 Chancellor's Award for Public Service. He has, uh, his street science book is the fourth most frequently read book at Brandeis University. And he received the 2013 United Nations Association Global Citizen Award. Uh, so when I want to grow up, I want to be like you. Uh, <laughs> so I want to welcome uh, Professor Jason Corbin. Wow, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's a little bittersweet. Can you hear me? Is it, is it okay? Yeah. Um, I was born and raised just a few blocks from here, and uh, you know, New York is still in my blood, although I've been in the Bay Area for over a decade now. So it's great to come back, always come back to New York, come back to Columbia, wonderful institution. Uh, the bitterness is that um, my dear, dear friend, uh, brother and colleague, uh, Professor Hudson is now here, and we've lost him, uh, and he's, he's separated from his, his roots in California, but you are so lucky uh, to have Malo uh, here with you. Let's see. Let's see if this can work. Yes, okay, great. So I'm going to talk about my work and the work that we're doing uh, in partnership with communities, local governments uh, around the world to really focus on this notion of health equity. I'm delighted that the, the focus of this, uh, this event is really on equity, uh, not just health. And I want to uh, emphasize what I mean by that. Uh, and I'm going to try to address or grapple with three key questions for us this afternoon uh, and invite you to, to help us uh, figure this out with our, also our, our wonderful panel. Um, so what I'm really concerned about also is how do we not just rethink the built environment, um, particular aspects that might make it more equitable and healthy, but how do we also redesign the institutions that make decisions? This is what I mean by urban governance and who's involved in that. Uh, and then what are the new demands that it places on us as scientists, as researchers, as policymakers, as practitioners? Um, we can't continue to do the same thing the same way and expect different outcomes. And I'll just give you some examples of that in a moment. And also, how do we build from new understandings in biology around the notion of trauma and toxic stress and what that does in our bodies, and how we can make that explicit in the way we work with and rebuild and support uh, community development. And I'm going to try to walk you through some of these ideas and examples in uh, three, three locations around the world, three cities, uh, again, where I'm working. There's no pointer here. Either. It's OK. Um, in Nairobi, in Kenya, Medellin, in Colombia, uh, and in Richmond, California, which is a small city in the San Francisco Bay Area, just to situate you um, about the journey I'm going to try to take you on in the next uh, few minutes. So just a, uh, a little background. Um, I don't know if I have to say too much about this for this audience, but we are on an urban planet. 
And what that means is that the complexities and opportunities, thank you, uh, of cities and urbanization um, create great opportunity. People come to cities for uh, ex social expression, cultural expression, gender equity, education, but also we see rising inequalities. Amala was mentioning migration, internal immigration, uh, inequalities. Uh, and we see this also in the rise of informal settlements, or sometimes called slums, and I don't like that word, but the UN uses it. And uh, so part of our challenge is as we urbanize, as this planet urbanizes, how do we at the same time put equity at the front and center of that urbanization and of that development? Well, the sustainable development goals you may have heard about are uh, trying to do that, although some may disagree on how explicit and how clear that needs to be. And there's two particular SDGs on health and cities that I think are particularly relevant to the work that I'm going to talk about. But I think, yeah, that's a little tiny green thing. Um, <laughs> there isn't much connection. There isn't much connection that I see between these two SDGs just, uh, just yet. Um, but one of the things that's really explicit and clear is that place matters. We've seen this right here uh, in New York City. Where you live matters where you grow up, what you're exposed to, what's happening in those places. And it's not just unique to New York or cities in the United States. This is Paris. Similar dynamic, the top red there, those bars are lower life expectancy uh, on the, the Parisian metro. And part of this, from my perspective, is what I call community malpractice. These situations of Incredible inequality and poverty right next to incredible wealth and uh, opportunity don't happen by accident. They happen either by a lack of planning and policy uh, or explicit policies that create these inequalities. So of course, the folks living in this favela on your left are cleaning the pools and taking care of the children and doing all of the risky, often low paid, high risk labor for the wealthy uh, on the right. And of course we can talk about spatial and place-based inequalities without also talking about how they're patterned by race and ethnicity. And here is some data from Alameda County uh, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and we can see that while everybody seems to be getting healthier in terms of life expectancy, the gap, the inequality between whites, in this case and African Americans, is growing. And we also see this pattern uh, by different health outcomes. You can name your health outcome, we'll see the same pattern chronic disease, life expectancy uh, around the United States, and in many, many, many cities across the world. So racism has to be put at the center of our conversation uh, about equity. Well, there's been a lot of international programs and reports and uh, meetings and special issues of some of our leading journals, Science and Nature, for example, about this notion of urbanization and even to some extent health. But a couple of observations from my perspective is that um, this work in science is still really still disconnected from the urban communities that need to benefit the most from and are most burdened, say, in issues of climate vulnerability, uh, pollution, inequalities, and often urban decision makers, still too disconnected. And that technology and urban design alone is not going to improve urban well-being for all. We can still see that general population increase, but within certain populations and communities, we're not going to close that gap, that health inequality. So we need new attention to how we do this work, who participates, and the institutions that we hope to redesign. Now, I know this isn't necessarily an, an all public health audience, but for those public health folks um, that this may be review, I apologize, but for the planners or non-public health people, when I talk about health equity, I just want to be clear about where I'm coming from. So much of public health, and I would argue a lot of interesting, important work in health, uh, is down here on your right-hand side, what we call the biomedical model or health care, health interventions. Hey, eat better, uh, change your behaviors. We can help you do that if we just give you the right information or the right app or whatever it might be. And we need treatment. People need access to care. Affordable Care Act is important for certain aspects, aspects of it, at least. But this, of course, in public health is what we know as disease management. This is not public health, in my view. This is not prevention. This is not promoting population health and health equity. If we want to really work towards health equity and 
improving community health, we've got to move to the left-hand side of this, of this uh, model here, into the living conditions, institutional inequalities, and social inequalities, some of which Malo mentioned in this introduction. Um, and how do we do that? It's not just talking about built environment or where you live or housing or the segregation as a result of housing and city policies or federal government policies uh, and discrimination and racism around immigration that's happening today. Um, but how do we build those partnerships? How do we engage community? And what are the explicit policies that need to change? The inequalities we see today in cities like New York, San Francisco, Nairobi, Colombia, where I'll talk about, have taken, in many cases, decades and even century or more to pr be produced. So we're not going to change these inequalities overnight. We need explicit changes, though, in our policies and institutions. So let me give you some examples of how we're trying to do this in three seemingly different, but I'll try to tie these three places together uh, in this work. So first, I'll bring you to East Africa, to Kenya and Nairobi in a partnership with these folks here, some of our partners. We've been working for about 10 years together on this work, so I'll give it you that what we've done over 10 years in 10 minutes. Um, and part of that, I say that, is because part of this work requires deep, long-term engaged partnerships. Uh, and and I'll, I'll say more about that uh, maybe in the, in the Q&A. We've been working in two particular communities. Here's Nairobi a community called Mathare and another one called Makuru, and I'll give you some specific examples uh, of what we've been doing to try to change living conditions and some of those structural inequalities. This is typically um, what a community, what a neighborhood looks like, and when I say a community, these are cities within a city. These are somewhere between three, 400,000 people within the city of Nairobi living in informal settlements. 65 to 70% of the city of Nairobi is is informal settlements. And that goes for Kampala and Dar es Salaam and many, many cities in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is not unique to Nairobi. What's also not unique is this. This is the strategy that the city county of Nairobi and the Kenyan government have put forward, at least in part, as a response to informality and inequality. Let's build the next Silicon Savannah. We've looked too closely at the Bay Area and fell in love with that thing, uh, Silicon Valley. But this is a top two city, a satellite city that says, hey, you know, forget about improving those communities. You know, that's going to be too hard. Let's go out and build a new city from scratch with all the energy and green and climate uh, innovations. It's hard to imagine how the folks living on $5 a day in, in Maku or Mathare are going to benefit from this shiny design city. So what have we done with our partners? This is really driven by uh, NGO partners and partnerships on the ground. The first thing that it starts with is something called micro savings. You may have heard of micro credit. This is a little bit different. This is where women-led groups save small amounts of money per day, pennies really per day, to bring people together, basically a community organizing strategy. But what they do explicitly is to begin to put themselves on the map. They organize and survey themselves. Just like in the United States, many poor folks in poor communities are not counted or undercounted, underrepresented. And so they, for the elite and decision makers, they sometimes don't appear. So we actually literally map the community. And this is critically important in a strategy that's used not just in Nairobi but around the world. And all of that feeds into a, a network power because every neighborhood savings group is networked to one across the entire city of Nairobi. And then every or almost every large community in Kenya has a similar set of organizations. And they have a network across Kenya of over 160,000 uh, household members in this network of savings, building power and actually building some financial capital to negotiate often with government and international organizations. Uh, so we've also partnered by bringing our students, our Cal Berkeley students, to partner with University of Nairobi students and community residents to map and do things like studio classes like you do, you, you do here. That data becomes really important to make the case in partnership with community residents that their conditions, particularly their health conditions, are not all the same. They face different issues. Um, and there's often a, a real intensive effort to focus on infectious disease. But you can see here that also chronic uh, illness and hypertension is a really significant issue, particularly in this community, the orange is Mathari. So 
Not all informal settlements is what we're showing in the same city, just like not all neighborhoods in New York City face the same challenges or need the same strategy. So you need to know that before you develop a strategy for intervention. A couple strategies we've used. This, what you're seeing here is the water system. This is the drinking water system. It's drinking water pipes, these little tiny things here. We call them spaghetti pipes. They're on the surface. You can see how vulnerable they are to being punctured or contamination. Uh, and that is what happens often. And what you also see is solid and human waste that sur on the surface drainage. So that gets contaminated. So part of our mapping and data collection was to actually map out in this entire community where are the water points? Where are people accessing water? And we put that in context like good public health researchers would with the sphere humanitarian standards. And I don't know if anybody's heard of that. But when there's an earthquake or a, ty you know, a, a typhoon or some major emergency, internally displaced people, and an emergency camp has to be set up basically overnight. The sphere standards are what you know, the Red Cross or some UN UNICEF agency would use to build that tent city, basically. And they recommend 250 people per water point. What we found is the everyday emergency that ex uh, folks in these communities are experiencing. The everyday emergency that needed emergency attention. Um, and that's what we tried to do. We went from that before to the design uh, to getting every household in one community metered, a water connection like you would expect when you go home tonight, to turn on a tap and have a tap in their house um, of clean, uh, water. But it, that wasn't enough. The engineers were happy and they left. But what we know from planning and public health is if it's not properly managed, a gang or a cartel might take it over and extort keep the price for people. Or it may fall into disrepair. So we needed that savings group, including young people, to be the leaders to actually manage this whole process, to make sure it's maintained, to collect the, the, the fees for, for the water meters. Uh, and that side. Well, here's what it looks like in, in, in the house. And we've done some evaluation after um, about a year and a half of this to see what were some of the health impacts for populations. And a couple things I'll point out is uh, the weight burden for women were off, almost exclusively ones collecting water uh, outside the home, burdening women, also young girls who were joining them to miss school days and the economic benefits of having clean water in addition to the things we might expect around disease were significant. Uh, this has become a model, it's called the Mathari Kosovo Water Model, so it's institutionalized into policy now uh, for many upgrading projects across Kenya. Uh, but there are also the poor who can't afford that, or they rent, they say, I, don't, I can't afford, I'm not gonna pay for a meter in my, in my house, and a tap in my house, so now we have these ATMs uh, where you put in a, uh, a charge card so you don't have to carry cash and you get clean water and you fill it up and it's managed and maintained also by the water company. Food insecurity is also a major issue like it is in many urban communities. People paying 50, 60 percent or more of their uh, income on food. We did a food survey with community health workers, residents in the community to try to figure out what were some of the hazards and risks that they faced. We found uh, over 40% of children under five are stunted, uh, in part because of lack of food, but also poor uh, nutrient absorption uh, because of the quality of the food. Um, people were skipping meals, and really disturbingly, many young women selling themselves for sex to feed them, their children or themselves on a regular basis. And you know, some of our NGO partners from international organizations, Kenya has a really interesting program where they have free clinics for free uh, HIV antiretroviral drugs and TB drugs. Um, so it's an amazing program across Kenya and has been seen as uh, really successful in some contexts to reduce rates of infection for HIV. Yet when people don't have food, those drugs are not uh, effective. And in fact, we found that people were trading those drugs for food. So we see this steep increase in um, HIV rates, particularly in women, and multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And that's something that happened in New York City in the 1970s, and we should have learned from that uh, about the relational dynamic uh, of what's happening in communities. And part of our response to that was to develop a food vendor cooperative uh, in this community. So many people are eating food uh, off 
from streets and street food from vendors because of poverty and other things. They're not cooking at home, which was another thing that many development folks were focused on. Hey, let's get people cook stoves. Let's get them produce. That's not what people are eating. 65, 70% of their meals are coming from street food. So focus on where are people getting their food and can we make it cleaner? Can we provide uh, transportation for good food uh, to support the price fluctuations and things like that? Another serious issue that you're seeing in cities around the world, whether it's from New York to Delhi to Beijing, air pollution, killing more people now in our cities um, than HIV, malaria, tobacco combined. Part of that is, is out of poverty and fuel choice here. Um, not any choice, but this is the typical fuel for both cooking, sometimes heating, inside <coughs> homes in the Nairobi informal settlements. It's charcoal. So black carbon, heavy particulate matter. With one of our partners, we've been doing a community citizen science project of monitoring the air and bringing that back into solutions, particularly around waste burning and waste management, some outdoor cooking, you see some of our partners, some of our young people in the neighborhood wearing backpacks here that uh, basically take real-time air samples. And we're able to do that um, and map this spatially. Again, I used to work for New York City government. I think at the time we had about six regional air monitors for the entire city of New York. It's probably maybe double that now. San Francisco Bay Area, um, big area, lots of pollution from cars. Uh, we have maybe about six. Nairobi has two. So, to get good data, good accurate information about the hazard of air pollution at the local level is almost impossible from the air districts from your normal government agencies with two or even six or even a dozen monitors. So that on the ground monitoring is critical. Uh, and you can see what we found and then how we use our technologies and spatial tools uh, to see where are the hotspots, where can we intervene uh, most, uh, most intently which is what we try to do, recognizing that not everybody is exposed uh, the same way, and to try to shift from cleaner, from dirty, sorry, to cleaner energy, particularly uh, electricity. Last example, probably the most critical issue in informal settlements around the world, particularly in Nairobi, is <coughs> uh, sanitation and toilets, and the disproportionate burden that that places on women and young girls, particularly around sexual violence, uh, and, and, and other serious issues. Again, we were able to map where are the toilets and what are the different kinds of toilets. I'm not going to get into it in detail here, but it's not all uh, just a pit latrine. Some of them are, have a lock, some don't. Some are in a yard, some are in grouped within. So <coughs> knowing where they are, how accessible they are, if a gang controls them, the social dynamics around that is critical. Again, you're seeing two toilets here, and some of these are, are also uh, bathing facilities draining right into this river. Uh, and you can imagine when it floods, which it has been very recently in, in Nairobi with heavy rains, all of that waste, all of the pathogens getting into where people are walking and living. Actually, this is a picture from just last week in Nairobi. Um, and expected to increase with climate vulnerability. So linking this work to a climate adaptation and resilience plan is what we're doing. On the right here, you're seeing a study from the World Bank, you may have seen, just released a few months ago, about where, there's, where are there going to be climate uh, refugees, basically. Where there's going to be out-migration, which is the blue, and then in-migration, which is the red. And Nairobi and other cities uh, in East Africa, Kampala here in Uganda, expected to have a great increase. And we're going to see this around the world. Where are people going? They're going to cities, they're going to be going to and increasing the, the pressures on informal settlements. So this work is, I think, going to be more and more important, and to have a plan and a response is going to be critical. Um, this is a tough issue. One of the things we've done is to try to get uh, international attention by publishing this work. Engaging young people has been critical to tell their story, to raise their voice about their experiences, particularly young girls. Our, our participants uh, had an essay contest, and here's our, our young guys doing some films and making some videos, which are all available on YouTube. I'm happy to give you that link of documenting their experience, and what, what they see as the challenges and, and ways of improving uh, their own community. Um, part of that has led to the first civil action lawsuit on behalf of over 12,000 Kenyan slum dwelling women here on the right hand side, marching and suing the Kenyan government. Because the Kenyan constitution revised in 2010 gives you, uh, every person a right to sanitation, to health, uh, and to a clean environment. 
U.S. Constitution doesn't have any of that in there. Um, and so they're suing the government to guarantee that to, to address these living conditions. I'm happy to report that some of that is actually happening now. This is a recent uh, proposal for uh, or expression of interest and in contracting that the Kenyan government and the city county of Nairobi to improve uh, and upgrade 26 informal settlements. A lot of that strategy is now happening and how it's happening, what are they prioritizing in terms of infrastructure, housing, who's involved through some of the data uh, that we've collected with our partners. Second quick example, um, another really, for me, an amazing city, an amazing country in Medellin, um, and, and also a city with great vast inequalities. Many of you have ever, uh, like many cities in Latin America or around the world, particularly uh, in Medellin, you have uh, up on the slopes, on the hillsides and the barrios, you have more uh, impoverished residents, and then you have very high wealth uh, in some other areas of the city. So vast disparities. And of course, most of you may associate Colombia with, I don't know if anybody's watching Narcos, is that still on? Uh, <laughs> um, which my Colombian partners hate that show, but they, they know folks are watching it. Uh, but the story really is the most violent city in the world. How do you reduce violence? And, and violence as we know, in many communities, affects everything. People's stress, whether they go outside and exercise, whether they can enjoy uh, the schools or go to school even, uh, eat, uh, you know, you name it. So in the early 90s, everybody associated Medellin with violence, and it was. It was the number one most violent gun homicide city in the world. Here it is today, 20, just a few years ago, now under 20. An incredible story and an incredible decline. How did that happen? That's what we've been looking at and trying to understand, and the population health impacts beyond just gun violence of that work. Um, it's been recognized globally as the city. If you aren't studying Medellin and planning and public policy and, and public health school, you might be missing something important. It's won every prize, and every media outlet is saying, hey, this is a miracle, this is a model. And we're a little skeptical of that, but we're happy that they're focusing on that. So how did that happen? In part, it happened through community leadership and engagement. They have something called participatory budgeting, where community residents, and this is one case in one of the most impoverished communities called Populaga, um, developed a plan, a health <coughs> equity action plan that included a whole host of things, of projects, of the built environment, of transportation, of social programs, of education, of ser improved services, linked to a comprehensive citywide, what they call an integrated development plan. Um, and what we're asking with our partners at the University of Antioquia uh, is what, what have been the population, again, and health equity impacts of that. You may have heard of the Metro Cable, the ski lift. I don't know if anybody here enjoys the snow. I particularly don't. I'm a warm weather guy, but <laughs> apparently ski lifts help you get up the steep slopes. Um, and so Medellin was the first city in the world to make that an integrated part of its public transportation system. Other cities now, Brazil and others have in Brazil have, have taken on that idea. But you went from an hour and a half steep walk uh, up a dangerous set of stairs or dirt uh, paths to a 15 to 20 minute ride. You can imagine the change in the dynamic. But also what's amazing is that, you know, six to 10 people sit in that car who don't know each other. And there's, there hasn't been one incident of violence in the Metro Cabo since it's been built. This whole culture of community of coming together of op reopening up the public space, the public sphere, has been a critical contribution of this. They also used a radical technology called escalators. I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but um, has also part of its public transportation system. So again, the most impoverished communities getting these interventions first and serving this community. Now it's a, tour a, a great tourist attraction. They have art and music 24 hours, and it's an amazing, amazing sight. Um, they turned, also at the innovation and request of residents, to turn the city dump into an eco-park. And that's what you're seeing here. The top is the city's dump site, and the bottom is now this, Moravia Garden, which is an eco-education uh, site where they're reintroducing native species, doing bio research, <coughs> and a whole host of things, employing local people, uh, and really rethinking their role uh, as in, in environmental um, leadership. Many of the urban and poor communities on the hillsides had no public space, no playgrounds, no place to gather, kids play in the street, people had very few places to come together. 
Uh, they said, hey, but we've got all of these walled in behind you know, barbed wire fence, uh, water towers, or wa water uh, storage facilities. Why not open those up to be public space, to be community designed and operated spaces? And that's what they did. They employed local architects, young people, to redesign these into what you see here, uvas, or their um, life articulated units, as they say. Um, where they have their play spaces, their cultural centers, arts, music, and community centers where people can come together. They also built um, education and uh, community engagement sites in places that were formerly places of death. This is one of my favorite examples. It's a former bull ring, and they designed the school and the community uh, center uh, uh, just like the, the kind of architecture around what the bull ring, but now it's also a place of, of lifelong learning, of bringing people together, particularly around conflict resolution, and as you know, just recently signing a peace agreement. Uh, Colombia has the second highest number of internally displaced people because of war uh, and other uh, activities, particularly drug trafficking, and people are coming to the cities. And so the city needs a plan, a program, to integrate folks, to resolve conflict, and to build community engagement. And this is what they're doing. They're also, also recognizing, uh, in an explicit way, the history and memory uh, of that conflict. Everybody you meet, if there's any Colombians in the room, I bet they would have a story about a relative or a friend that's been kidnapped or killed. It has touched everyone in society. Uh, making that part of the narrative, part of the culture of, of healing of trauma recovery. And not doing this in downtown, so you go down to, you know, over the east side, or you go to uh, lower Manhattan for where all your museums and arts and culture are. The most beautiful parks, the most beautiful museums, library parks, all of that public transportation that I just talked about was implemented first in the poorest, most violent neighborhoods. It would be like saying, we're gonna build the most beautiful museum in New York in the South Bronx and East Harlem first before all the rest of the museums get any in reinvestment. And that's what they did, particularly around community space. And the challenges we see violence here going down, <coughs> but then we see things like, this is respiratory illness, cardiovascular disease, slightly on the uptick. So we want to try to see you know, who's benefiting, what have been the population health impacts uh, of this, and we're continuing to study this. What have we learned from that that I think is uh, particularly uh, important for both uh, places like Nairobi and, and uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, which I'll talk about in a moment. Well, they have a particular philosophy of social urbanism, which again is this idea that um, urban development, urbanization, urban architecture should first have a social equity mission, secondly be efficient. And that part of that ethics of aesthetics is the most beautiful and functional projects go into the poorest communities first with deep, deep community participation in the design, implementation, and operations. Community residents are working at all those UBAs, at all those schools, getting jobs, um, and benefiting from that investment. And that part of that is that the targeted approach, not a citywide upgrading strategy first, benefits everybody. That's the notion of targeted universalism. They do have um, a unique situation where they have a, a utility that's a monopoly so that it's all the water and sewer and electricity. But they also have an innovative law that says 30% of their profits have to be go, go back to the city for social projects and social programs. So that's a lot of where they get the, their funding. And I think part of the story about reducing this violence has been to reorient the face and function of the state in Medellin. And we see really a reverse of some of this in Latin America now, where you know, armed military are the strategy to violence in barrios and favelas, or even in the United States. And what Medellin really did, I think, significantly was say, hey, the state is not just about weapons and artillery, uh, uh, you know, uh, military, but it's about public space, it's about integration, it's about schools, it's about um, providing services and, and new spaces and opportunities for everyone, particularly the urban poor. Finally, I'll talk about our work in, in my new neighborhood, uh, Richmond, California. Richmond is, is here. Here's Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, for those of you who don't know that other coast. 
Um, and Richmond, some people talk about Richmond, you know, as the industrial dumping ground of the Bay Area, and, and it was uh, for a long time, but it was also a site of interesting uh, industrialization. The Kaiser Shipyards, World War II, which brought um, over 50,000 African Americans from the south of the United States there, uh, and an incredible uh, rise in population. But it's also an amazing sanctuary city, for, and it has been for a long time one of the oldest sanctuary cities in the state of California for new immigrants, Laotian, Latino, Vietnamese, and others. Uh, so that history is really critical. It's also the most, ninth most violent city in the United States when we first started in 2007, 2009, and the lowest life expectancy. And the question was, how can we transform? And after 10 years of work, which I'll talk about, we see some of this. We can't take credit for unemployment, although I'll take, we take credit wherever we can. Um, but things like self-rated health, we have a survey of every two years of people uh, including both low-income folks and folks of color, and that's increasing. These are just general for the entire city. Um, but we're also really uh, focused, again, on inequalities of discrimination and racism. Uh, this is a, a positive sign of, of self-reported that going down, place for youth, and again, gun homicides. Major, major change. One of the most successful programs that I'll talk about in a moment in the United States. And we're happy that other folks are paying attention to what's happening in Richmond. Because we do think there are some lessons like for Nairobi and Medellin for other communities. And it really starts and started with deep community engagement and community members coming together to document what they thought were both the problems, but also what did they want. Instead of asking, hey, what's, what's wrong here? Much of this work, uh, work asks, what do you think needs to happen here to, for this to be health, a place of health, of equity, and a city for life? And that's what these two reports um, documented. And that work really influenced uh, and acknowledged that history was important, that you can't do planning and public health today without recognizing where folks have come from, the legacy of the place and the population, particularly Japanese incarceration, internment, um, and the, the land that was stolen in Richmond <coughs> from folks, uh, and, and the, 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 you know, the, the impact that that was having on, on communities today, and also the Black Panther movement, critical in Oakland, but also many of the leaders were implementing some of the most innovative community health programs from uh, breakfast programs and outreach in Richmond as well. So there's still a legacy of folks who remember that and were involved in that important and critical social movement. Now, both of those, the history and the community ideas and narratives were built into two um, innovative laws and policies uh, that we drafted in Richmond. The first on your left was the Richmond's general plan. So um, I know there's some planners in the room. We actually do planning in California, coming from New York. Sometimes planning doesn't seem to exist too much, but by law, every jurisdiction in California has to have a plan. Of course, mostly we do plans, they're this high, they sit on the shelf, uh, and hopefully someone looks at them, but not many people do. So what we did in Richmond, in part, well, entirely because it was pressure from community groups who were doing this research and engagement. They said, hey, you're going to do one of those land use community plans and no one's going to read it? We want environmental justice. We want health equity. We want a strategy to reduce gun violence which are our three major concerns in your land use plan. So of course the land use consultants looked around and said, we don't know how to do that, we've never done that before. Uh, and in fact it had never been done in the state of California to put health equity as an explicit chapter. Of course, we do all the things in these, in these general plans like transportation and energy and housing and all the things we talk about in planning, but not health, particularly not health equity. So at the community's pressure and with some support from the local foundation, we were able to do that using research and action and put in uh, strategies, policies, and, and measures, indicators of, of progress uh, into the general plan. It was the first health element, it was called, in the state of California. Uh, now over 50 jurisdictions have done the same thing in the state of California, and it's really a model um, in many, many communities across the country. The other first we did was pass the first ordinance of any city in the United States of health in all policies. And it's really health equity in all policies. And some of you may know what this is, but it's really taking 
a health equity framework and putting it into a screening in some ways into almost every decision that the city makes. So when it does its five-year budget or its annual budget, when it goes to contract with all of the folks it contracts with, cities are mostly contracting with your tax dollars, how is that addressing health equity? When they're deciding on where they're going to pave streets or invest in parks um, or put up fencing or improve drainage, where is that happening spatially? Who's benefiting? Those are the kinds of questions. Um, and Richmond is also part of the Government Alliance for Race and Equity. Um, and part of this is really being a, a, a part of that conversation. So institutionalizing this work, particularly with a structural inequality and structural racism framework, has been critical. And that also came out of community conversation. This, the, the framework that drives the, the health uh, equity plan and the health and all policies is really around the notion of multiple toxic stressors. And I know some of you from public health, this is going to be um, you know, not too exciting for you, but, but, but a lot of folks think, hey, if we just get one of these right, we'll improve communities like Richmond or Nairobi or Medellin or uh, East Harlem. If we just get housing or we just get Food, you know, address food security, or just address violence, or poor education. But the reality is, is folks in communities like Richmond and others face multiple stressors across the lifetime, even in utero, before they're born. So we can't just continue to do the same thing, segment, fragmented work, one at a time. And that's, that's really what we heard in multiple languages from residents. So we really wanted to build that into the work. Um, and just to review what's the biology uh, behind this, is that you know, stress is good. That final or midterm of uh, Professor Hudson's you know, going to administer, we get stressed out. Uh, and that's good for you. That's the flight or flight mechanism. And you're, you get this hormonal release. Uh, your body gets heightened. Your blood pressure goes up. Your heart rate goes up. And hopefully your body um, uh, performs. And when that stress disappears, uh, you hopefully return back to normal. Um, but under a toxic, chronic stress situation, multiple stressors in people's neighborhoods and life across the life force from early life throughout aging, that stress release doesn't turn off. And that's the notion of toxic stress, the constant release on these hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And that, many folks argue, and our approach also supports, is what's contributing to this rise in chronic disease. Not that people aren't exercising enough, not that the sidewalks aren't wide enough, not that there isn't a community garden in their neighborhood. Those are great. But if we don't address these fundamental stressors, all of that surface stuff isn't going to matter for both these chronic illnesses, immune system diseases, which we see an increased, really uh, significant rise, and also um, you know, epigenetics. We talk about telomeres, which are the caps on the end of our chromosomes that protect us from aging, premature aging, early death, suspected of this chronic stress. So how, how do we do that? I'll take questions in a sec. Um, one was to, to focus on community, uh, community responses to what they wanted in, in the neighborhood in terms of changes in design. So we didn't ignore uh, neighborhood um, needs in terms of uh, access to resources, built environment, particularly folks who were and have experienced trauma, uh, like gun violence, and making space and uh, access important for folks with uh, dis disabilities. We've also focused on housing. Richmond's become the first city in the United States to adopt something called a social impact bond. Instead of floating a normal city bond for a return on that investment, they want a social return. Uh, and our social return is affordability and affordable housing, um, and building supportive housing, which includes uh, services right in the, in the neighborhood and in the, in the unit itself. And importantly, in Richmond, we have a program called Richmond Build, which is partially funded by the US EPA, although I don't think that's going to continue much longer, um, where young people from Richmond are trained in the construction industry and also in solar installation and uh, energy efficiency, uh, which is also happening. Uh, to build the housing and they can afford to live in it. And that's the, stra that's the idea. We're building affordable housing in some places, but the folks doing the construction can't even afford to live in that house. Uh, so we wanted to really change that, that dynamic. We also took clues from Latin America and said, hey, we're going to focus in on particular neighborhoods that are most hardest hit. 
This is one called the Iron Triangle, and it's called that because of this uh, railroad tracks that border. Well, th this one now is turned into a greenway. Uh, the most violent, most impoverished, 100% folks of color, mostly African Americans and Latino. Uh, and we decided, uh, or community residents said, hey, this park here can act as the heartbeat of this neighborhood to revitalize and pump more life uh, and health into our community. And part of that uh, general plan, we set aside some resources and an explicit intervention into this called Elm Playlot and Pogo Park. And what had happened was that little park, the city spent $100,000, which isn't much, and they bought a beautiful play structure from a firm in Texas, and they came and put it into that park, and everybody was really happy because the park had been vandalized and was behind fence, and they took it down, and they had a ribbon cutting, and everybody, all the mayors and everybody were happy, and the next day, you can guess what happened. Uh, it was fully tagged up. Uh, some of the, the local gangs were back in that park controlling it, and no one had access. So the idea was to reclaim this public space, and community members design it. And they designed it incrementally with what they wanted. And in fact, they were trained and learned the skills to build the play equipment themselves. So instead of buying it from some firm somewhere else, they actually learned how to weld and do, do the park benches, the, the <coughs> fencing, the pathways. And importantly today, they work and program at that space. That park acts as one of the um, sites that gives out more food and summer programs than any other institution in the city of Richmond to young people. So uh, they participate in, in food programs, they have a community kitchen, they do a whole host of things um, that are community driven. Trauma and youth trauma is also a significant and continues to be a significant issue in Richmond, in part because of gun violence, but also poverty and these toxic stressors I was talking about. Uh, this is an organization <laughs> called RISE. And they have, uh, were founded by young people, 16 to 18 year old young people said, we need a safe space. We need a place to come together. Uh, and they did, and after um, now about eight to 10 years, they've had their own community center that they've outgrown and that are facing new challenges. Young people are no longer, or well, they're no longer 16 or 18. Now they have young families uh, and they're in their 20s or older. Uh, so they've embarked with our partnership on uh, what we're calling a trauma-informed community development of something called Rise Commons, which is a new community space that's incorporating ideas from community health centers uh, to youth-led uh, uh, public space to really uh, micro-enterprise and to really engaging in the broader community into uh, how do they do a public space that's healing. And finally, again, just like in cities like Medellin, gun violence was crippling neighborhoods but was really just focused in some parts of Richmond. It wasn't the whole city that was kind of under siege. Um, and so one of the things that came out of our health equity work was, again, to rethink city governance. And one suggestion was, hey, let's create an office of peacemaking. You say, all right, that's California. They would never do that here. <laughs> um, maybe that's true. But we said, hey, you got an office a plan A, you got a, you know, a, a, a city agency for transportation, for all of these other issues. Why not peace? And we know it's not happening in the police department. We know that the police are incarcerating folks and locking people up and killing people. There's not, they're not peace officers by any, any means. We need to take peacemaking outside of the police. So, well, all right, let, so we negotiated with the city council and the city manager for two years to create the Office of Neighborhood Safety. That was a big lift. But we said, hey, not only do we want this office, we want it to be staffed and run by all former felons, folks who were all from Richmond who went away for six to 60 years for life, some for murder and spent time in prison. We want them to run it. All felons, public servants now. They said, oh, you are really crazy. <laughs> That's against the law. <coughs> We're not gonna hire felons to be part of the city government. So we fought for that and we argued for that and we actually won that battle after two years. And um, so we created this Office of Neighborhood <coughs> Safety. Uh, and we've had uh, incredible success, the model just briefly, is about street level outreach to the really under 200 or so known or suspected uh, gun offenders, mostly young people. Um, it's 
it's uh, true in many, many cities, from Chicago to New York to Baltimore, St. Louis, and Richmond, Sacramento, um, that most of the violence is retaliatory, gun violence, and it's perpetuated by a small number of, of folks. So if you could reach them, what's the strategy, and engage them, see the humanity in these young people, um, maybe we could turn that around. And that's what we've tried to do, and that's what the Office of Neighborhood Safety has done. An incredible reduction um, in gun homicides, firearm assaults. Uh, this is the, the strategy. It's an 18-month fellowship where we engage people uh, on, in, in the streets. And after six months, if they're ready, we engage them in an 18-month fellowship, just like the going to graduate school, uh, where they get a life map, they get mentoring, they get opportunities uh, to travel, they get opportunities to um, do internships and jobs. And if they participate, they also get some cash. And that's been really controversial. And I want to say something about that in a second and show you a video to close out on, on this work. Uh, but that also saves money. The biggest expenditure for every city in the world often is their police department. So if you're reducing the cost of overtime, of investigations, of ER visits, of ER costs for a gunshot, um, you can reinvest that into the community, and that's what we've been, uh, that's what we're doing, and that's also what we're evaluating, particularly a peace dividend to new mom, to, to pregnant women, to see if we can address this um, uh, really uh, crisis of low birth weight and maternal mortality in the African American community and, and adverse childhood experiences I'm talking about in a moment. But just to wrap up, um, what ought we think about? Uh, what are the lessons from these three places? Uh, what are the limits? What are the opportunities to think about health equity as you develop a action research strategy here and, and in other places around the world? Uh, primarily, we got to start with community involvement, community expertise uh, as really leading and defining not just problems but assets in neighborhoods uh, and learning from the histories of places uh, and often uh, the, bi the, the biographies of folks who live there. Uh, engaging with this idea of multiple toxic stressors, understanding the biology and the impact on our brain, on our cognitive development, impulse control, and seeing some of this uh, as ways of uh, how do we develop community responses uh, and inform a trauma-informed youth-led uh, approach. This idea of really drilling down, and I know New York City is doing some of that now, uh, into neighborhoods and communities hardest hit and where folks need resources, support, services the most. Uh, and not trying to do this as broad, uh, comprehensive city or regional wide. Um, but everybody benefits when we have these targeted strategies. And uh, importantly, in our work, uh, putting this into policy, institutionalizing this, codifying this into law has been critical. Often we think that this work, however we think about it, is you know the role for nonprofits or community groups and NGOs and, and others or foundations to fund on a two year grant cycle. It's not going to work. We need to rethink the institutions of government and make this work at the heart of those new institutions. It can't be on the fringe. It's got to be built into the city's budget. It's got to be built into the new institutions and funded with new folks who are real experts, like our ONS team. Uh, and really, this is about not waiting till we have all the answers. In public health, we have a tendency to wait way too long Epidemiology is a great science to count dead people and sick people. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, you know, that's not acceptable. We have, but we need to act and know we may be wrong. We'll likely be wrong, but we need to adjust and learn as we go uh, and learn from practice, learn from action, um, again, with community uh, residents as, as both you know, defining those issues, acting uh, and, and, and being a part and, and leaders, again, in that, in, in, in that process. There are no catch-all solutions, you can see. This uh, often integrated, it's messy, it takes a long time. Uh, there's no one shot, uh, and one, one solution that's gonna get us there. Uh, but we need to think in an integrated, critical way uh, and really prioritize equity at the heart of what we do. Thank you. This is our wonderful panel here. Um, so we have uh, Nipper Charter. Uh, she is a bridge builder and translator in the fields of urban planning and public health. Uh, she serves as a program officer for the New York State Health Foundation. Um, and she has developed and implemented strategies to support residents, communities, and neighborhoods to build trust, strong, and equitable communities. Uh, we also have um, Mandu Sen. Uh, 
she is a program manager at the Regional Plan Association, uh, working primarily on the, the new fourth regional plan, really important uh, project uh, here in the New York region. Um, she focused on long-term uh, planning and how to improve health and equity and works to translate the impact of digital technologies into policies uh, around infrastructure and governance. And of course, our uh, host, uh, uh, Professor Mal Hudson, uh, who is the director here of the Urban Planning, uh, Urban Community and Health Equity Lab at ESAP. Um, so what we wanted to do is to really just give our, our panelists who have, I think, a range of, of expertise and experiences around really tackling uh, health and equity in, in cities to give a few minutes of reflections on, on their work and really how it connects to uh, some of the wonderful uh, publications that um, uh, Professor Corbett just left with us. Um, so if we can start with that. Sure. Um, so I have to start off and say that this panel is a little bit of, um, does it show like this is your life? Uh, and I'm, I gotta say that because uh, when I was studying first, when I started uh, doing work in India, when I came back to this country, uh, and I started my urban planning public health work, uh, I met Malo in Michigan uh, at the age of maybe 22 or 23, then shifted to New York, um, and ended up getting my public health degree up at Columbia here, um, and read Jason's work, Street Signs, uh, and then stayed in New York for many, many years, 10, maybe 12 years now. Um, got to meet Justin in my work in Brownsville, um, and now, very luckily, we get to serve on the board of being Brownsville together, um, and have gotten to know Mangu because of her amazing work around uh, developing the fourth regional plan. So it's really an honor and a delight to spend this Friday afternoon with all of these great folks um, who have been such a part of my work and, and uh, my practice here in New York. Uh, so, as Justin mentioned, um, I'm a program officer at the New York State Health Foundation. Uh, the New York State Health Foundation is what they call a health conversion foundation. So there are a lot of uh, there were a lot of uh, healthcare organizations about 10 to 15 years ago that were going from I always I always mess up it's either from for profit to non profit non profit to for profit. But anyways, they were converting um, and they had to actually get rid of. Uh, a large amount of their um, their money is very in, in specific ways, and so that's why you see a lot of uh, statewide health foundations like um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Foundation of Minnesota, um, the California Endowment is a health conversion foundation. So New York State Health Foundation is one of those, um, and we're from Blue Cross Blue Shield money, um, and they basically created the foundation um, uh, a little over ten years ago, and then walked away. And so we really, with the help of um, the state government that actually appoints our board, we actually really uh, decide and shape our priorities for what we think to be uh, most beneficial for the health of all New Yorkers. And very similar to what Jason was talking about in terms of uh, really thinking about health and health care and having that be kind of the bulk of the work that was happening, um, you can see that trajectory through the history of the New York State Health Foundation. Uh, they were very well known for a lot of the work around diabetes and diabetes care. Um, and I would say about maybe three to four years ago, they were realizing that a lot of the investments that the foundation was making uh, in uh, preventing and kind of um, uh, really managing diabetes really wasn't working. And so they started to think more upstream, uh, which is what brought me to the foundation, the priority area called building healthy communities. Um, so we primarily focus on six communities across uh, New York State, three in the city. So East Harlem, the Lower East Side, and Brownsville. And then upstate, we focus on Niagara Falls, Syracuse, and Clinton County. Clinton County is a whole county, but it's 85,000, which is the same population as Brownsville. So whether it's a neighborhood or a county, you can, you can make your own decision. But so part of it is that we really wanted to focus on the neighborhood as a unit of analysis and understand that really focusing on clinics and healthcare was really not the way to go if we're thinking about obesity, if we're thinking about diabetes, if we're thinking about hypertension. We need to be thinking about the neighborhoods, the spaces, the places, and the people. And so um, the Building Healthy Communities Priority Area is one that really lends to uh, the example, Jason, that you gave around uh, urban acupuncture, really focusing in on six, six neighborhoods across the state that have disproportionately high um, uh, health outcomes as related to diabetes, uh, obesity, hypertension, et cetera, um, and really focusing in 
on the community residents, the community organizations, and the community stakeholders that have been there and will continue to be there, and investing in the work that they have been doing for a while. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, wow, to follow up Jason's uh, presentation, that's a heavy lift. So thank you, Mala, for organizing this. <laughs> Uh, I'm really excited to be here again. My name is Mandy Sen. I work at Regional Plan Association, um, and I'll talk just a little bit more about this. But first of all, just thanks. It's you know really a big one of the first times we have here in New York uh, convening sort of that brings together people from different angles of the health and urban planning. We're just speaking the microphone. Sorry, uh, it's really the first time I think we've had such a public event, facing event that brings together people from the health and planning world that are working on both sides. In, in you know such an intense way to talk about actually how to do the work. Uh, so thank you very much, Malo, for bringing us all together. And I'm really excited about today's discussion. Um, so I work at the Regional Plan Association. Um, just actually, a quick question: uh, How many of you are urban planning students? And how many of you are public health students? And how many of you are something else? Designers. Designers. <laughs> Um, thank you. So we have a really huge crowd, which is great. Um, and you're all working in the same field, by the way. Uh, and this is what we're here to tell you. Um, so I work with the Regional Plan Association. We're an organization that by now we can almost say we've been around for a century. Uh, and really, uh, we're a civic group that was formed in the 1920s to connect New York City that was sort of exploding into all the development activity that was happening right outside of New York City. Um, and at that time, it was mostly connecting it by highways. Um, we did that by publishing the first regional plan, uh, which is the first plan in our history. And since then, we've pu uh, published by now three additional plans, including the final one that's called the fourth regional plan originally, uh, that we just came to, you know, uh, a few months ago, uh, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But really, you know, as a civic group that has been here based in New York City for 100 years, we really kind of, you know, we reflect and we've expressed the history of the region and the history of planning in the region and in the United States overall. Um, so the first regional plan uh, came together because of a group of decision makers in the region, including, uh, you know, sort of basically the who and who of New York society uh, sort of saw a need and came to meet it. Uh, and this was not a government entity, and if we're still to this day, we're a civic group and we're not a government entity. And the reason for that is that effectively the metropolitan region of New York, so the shared economy, the shared transportation system, the shared community patterns of where do you live versus where do you work, crosses not just municipal but state boundaries, right? So people come to, into New York every day from New Jersey, from Connecticut. Um, they might commute from the Hudson Valley to Connecticut or vice versa, uh, from Long Island into Manhattan. <coughs> this is sort of the rhythm of the region, this is the economy of the region, and this also means that if you're uh, making an investment in a suburb in New Jersey, you're actually influencing the overall economy of the entire region. Um, and the reason we were a civic group is that not only do we have three states controlling this region, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, but also 782 municipalities, and only one of them is New York City. And today we have 23 million people and about 11 million jobs in this metropolitan region that's completely crisscrossed and completely divided by every possible boundary that you can imagine. Um, and so going back just a little bit to our history, the first plan, like I said, was about connecting the region, you know, with, with an emphasis on roads, and we really didn't need a lot of those roads, or maybe we were a little overeager. Um, the second plan came in the 60s, and this was really a response to, you know, uh, sort of rapid suburbanization and the overbuilding of roads, uh, and uh, really emphasized the amazing centers in New York, New York has, the amazing transit New York has, and tried to move back to this idea of a multi-center region with uh, different hubs. Uh, third plan uh, in the 1990s uh, was sort of the first time that we really explicitly put equity on the uh, agenda, you know, emphasis on the three E's, uh, equity, environment, 
Uh, economy, right. <laughs> it's out of fashion, so I almost forgot it. I was like, oh, we talked about it. Um, and, um, and that was really in sight of a crisis. It was a crisis slide, it was a response to a crisis in New York City, sort of really, you know, uh, only beginning to emerge from sort of downturn, um, you know, because we're still in the age of suburbia, which is just the beginning of people looking back into cities. Uh, the fourth plan that came out in November 2017, the pieces of it are still coming out, so you know you can check it out on fourthplan.org, um, is really in light of sort of three crises that have been happening in the region. The first is inequality. Um, you know, even after, we don't need to tell anyone, even after the financial crisis and recovery, you're still seeing deepening inequality, deepening gaps in income, and who gains from growing economy, uh, and relatedly housing crisis. And underneath a lot of that, of course, uh, the legacy of institutional racism and segregation of policies that we've all had to live with. Um, the second piece is climate change. Uh, 2012, you know, super strong standing was a huge wake up call, uh, and you know, never waste a crisis. Um, <laughs> The third was sort of aging infrastructure. Uh, we, at the time, you know, a lot of people have been saying for a while that New York's infrastructure is crumbling, the New York region's infrastructure is crumbling. Of course, we're, now we're all living it. I think a few years ago it was still hard to see. We didn't expect actually to see the infrastructure crumble in our, you know, so quickly. Um, and underlying all that, though, is a real crisis in governance, and I think this is where health comes in. Real crisis in the ability to make decision making. Because a lot of the decisions we're talking about are common sense decisions around which you actually do have a fair amount of consensus, but it was really hard to get done. Um, so come the fourth plan and its solutions, and I won't take too much time to talking about them broadly, we're talking about, especially when it comes to health equity, broad affordability by rebuilding around, you know, the various, we have huge potential around train stations all across the region and in the city, whether it's places like Queens and Riverdale, as well as places like, um, you know, Long Island and Northern New Jersey and Hudson Valley. We have, you know, amazing train stations and a lot of uh, parking lots that will soon be vacant and a lot of places where you can have ADUs, you know, um, additional housing units within sort of single family detached homes, etc. But also deep affordability and really targeting displacement, you know, putting all the resources we need to target displacement, things like that. Needless to say, there was inclusive, really aggressive proposals around the subway, the one that made a lot of noise was the one around, um, it was actually just a line, but, you know, potentially considering closing the 24-7, it's actually just sort of one way, and the reason I'm raising it is not even because, you know, it's sort of a firm recommendation, but it shows the kind of trade-offs that we need to manage and why health has a role. That's great. Um, I, I want to talk today about institutions. So I'm a big believer in institutions. I'm a professor here at Columbia and director of the lab, which I talked about. But the question I have for you is, what is the role of the 21st century university? Just what is the role? And I'm going to tell you a short story about, um, many people ask me as a professor, how are you able to combine theory and practice? And I actually don't see them being separate from each other, because what I do is how I try to live my life in the, in the classroom and in institutions, as well as in the real world. So my view of the world and the role of universities is to solve complex issues, plain and simple. There are a number of issues out there. You have incredible resources at a university, all of the human capital here, to think about how do we be very innovative, how do we think outside the box, and how do we go and transform the world by working with institutions and organizations and, and community groups and so forth. So in 2010, I got a phone call from Oakland Unified School District. It was the general counsel who said, we heard you do community development very well. We have a big problem. Can you come to a meeting tomorrow? So I said, of course, I'll come down to the school. And they said, we want to build a central kitchen, an urban farm, and an education center to bring locally sourced food to the children of Oakland Unified School District. The children of Oakland Unified School, School District, 70%, over 70%, qualified for free and reduced lunch. And yet, they were served frozen, packaged food every day. And this radical idea that the school district had was, hey, we're in California. We have a Central Valley right near us. Right now, we have asparagus being grown in South America, flown to China for packaging, and then flown to the Bay Area, 17,000 miles. 
and we have a central valley that grows asparagus right nearby. So I thought, what could go wrong? I'm at this meeting, everything sounds great. And, and they said, but the community's not supporting this. And so the lesson learned for the students in the room, I said, well, who have you talked to? No one in the community. They had plans for the project. They had lots of support for the project. You have the Center for Equal Literacy, which does wonderful work really leading this project. And yet, from the, you know, from the school district side of things, they had not knocked on any doors. And so the first thing I said is, if I take on this project, then you have to stop everything you're doing and allow us to engage, my team to engage with the community. So they agreed to that, and I said, one other caveat, I can only answer to the general counsel, because I wanted to take politics out of things and just go in. So to make a long story short, we knocked on lots of doors, engaged residents. They had, right across the street from this proposed site, people might even talk to them about it. And whether you're for it or not, one thing that people do not like is when you make plans and not include them in that process. And so that's what literally was starting to happen, is that they, many people were starting to be against the project, not because they didn't think it was a good project, as I say, they think it's a good project. I don't like the process. So from there, um, to make a long story short, we ended up getting the project approved, engaged the community very deeply, and then as a professor, so this is through my firm, and then as a professor I said, I could keep taking the school district's money by doing this engagement, or I can actually leverage being at Berkeley at the time as a professor and take this and really you know, focus on policy and research. And what I did is I was able to put a team together from law, uh, planning, education, and public health to say we have a natural experiment here. We have a situation for what students are dealing with now with the school, school food program. We talk to teachers, saying many children are not eating. Um, so it was, it was a bad situation. Uh, so we ended up getting grant money to now study this process. So actually see what's happening now, engaging with parents in focus groups. And through that, we start to find out um, Many are unaccompanied, unaccompanied minors. Many have come from elsewhere around the world because of uh, war and violence. And so from there, many people did not even know each other. The school uh, lunches were not culturally appropriate. And so what happened was the Center for Equal Literacy decided to launch a program called Rethinking School Lunch Open, which is to serve locally sourced food to students on Thursdays, and then eventually start doing it as, as many other days a week. Uh, it's now a statewide program, and, do, and I won't get into that right now, but, the, I, but to fast forward, we've been engaging in this process for now about four years, almost four years, and it's now gone statewide to look at what's happening in the food system. And we recently finished a project for the California Department of Food and Agriculture, who is saying we need, as a state, a state of 40 million people, we now need to start thinking about our food system, and what we looked at was procurement, so what happens when a school district starts saying, we will buy locally from you. We will buy locally from you. We will go to you as a farmer. And what that does for the school in terms of building relationships in the community, also bringing parents to the table and engaging them in the process, bringing teachers to the table. So to make a long story short, it's not all perfect, uh, but we're very happy with what, how things have turned out. And we're able to now publish on this. We're able to try to push for a policy. And I tell you, it's very empowering when you can go to Sacramento, like we did, meet with the uh, head of the California Department of Food and Agriculture and say, this is something that's a priority for me and we really want your advice on how we can move this forward. Uh, so there are ways to combine theory and practice. I would say many of us here at Columbia, an uh, institution with a tremendous amount of resources, there's a lot we can do. Uh, so I'll leave it at that, but that's going to be my hat today is talk about institutions from primarily universities and the relationship we can build with nonprofit organizations, government, and so forth. Great. Um, thank you all. And, um, I, I'll only leave a, one question because I want to get uh, time for comments from the audience, but I would re really like to hear from all of you about uh, really how we prioritize these issues in our work, whether it's in academia, in practice, or within various institutions. Uh, you know, I always say that cities are people. It's like the very simplest way to kind of understand what we do, which is really to Monday's point, right? We're all in the same field, which is really reconciling that notion of the cities of people. Um, so there's so many ways. There's sustainability, there's resilience, smart cities, all these kind of trends that are really demanding the kind of the uh, power, the money, the attention from government, from private practice. 
there are so many kind of directions that people are pulled within. What are some of the ways that you all have found to bring this equity and health focus to being central, to being kind of a, an anchor point or a lens uh, to really advance the work that needs to be done? <laughs> and I mean, you've been working in this kind of global context, right? So working with you know all of the different kinds of partners. How do you get so many different types of constituents to kind of land on this point in your work? Okay. Yeah, I was hoping for an easier question at first. Um, <laughs> no, I think a lot of it's been been sort of said already. First is, um, I mean, there's an idea. Like I said, I'm from New York, and and. When people would come to New York as consultants to say, hey, we think we can help with this problem, we would say, hey, New York's like no other place. Um, so you really can't help us because you don't really know New York. And then the uh, Bay Area, San Francisco, they said, well, you know, California, San Francisco, it's like no other place. You can't. <laughs> and then we were working in Kenya, you know, on and on and on. So every place is, no, like, is like no other place. And I think the lesson there is that folks really need to be listened to about what they understand about their own place. Um, and, and where are people at? What are they, how are they defining their community as healthy, unhealthy, needs, resources, relationships with institutions, with big like universities, others like government, um, private sector, et cetera. So I think that you know, really walking in and approaching a problem with great humility and critical listening skills it, it is the first thing about how do you prioritize. You don't prioritize, you listen and try to understand where people are coming from uh, and then try to connect some of those dots. Yeah, and I would just add to that. Um, I think early on in my work, a lot of it was focused on, you know, health with a big H, urban planning with a big U, uh, big U and big P. Um, but as I started working in, um, in Brownsville as uh, Brownsville Partnerships Health Coordinator, uh, our conversation was always about Brownsville. It was always about the neighborhood. What makes sense for the neighborhood? What makes sense for this space and place? What makes sense for these people? And to do that, knowing that I am not a resident of Brownsville, although I reported to Brownsville every day, I invariably had to connect with and talk to and work alongside people who are from Brownsville, who live in Brownsville, who are born and raised in Brownsville. And so a lot of my work now as a program officer is that I focus on six neighborhoods, some of which like Brownsville that I know very well, um, some of which like Niagara Falls that I still continue to get to know. Um, and it is a matter of having, I mean, as, as a program officer, I sit in a place of power and privilege and I have a lot of people coming to me saying, I have the solution that I have the answer. And here's how much it'll cost. And what I have to do then is that I have to then say, got it, awesome, fabulous, <laughs> great. And then I have to turn around and I have to say, friends in Niagara Falls, I'm gonna come up for a couple of days and I have a couple of proposals in front of me and I wanna to talk to you about them because they're telling me that this is a solution. I'm not completely sold or I am sold in this way. Does this make sense for you? Because for me, from where I sit, I'm lucky in the sense that my priority area is thinking about six neighborhoods. So the neighborhood is always a unit of analysis. It is always, what does this do and how does this affect the neighborhood itself? So invariably, it goes back to having conversations with both grantees that I currently fund, but also stakeholders that I know in each of those neighborhoods saying that I have X, Y, and Z thoughts or X, Y, and Z uh, report is coming out um, from the West Coast. Um, could this happen in New York? If so, what would it look like? Would you be interested in working with me on that? And Manila thinks sort of this theme of kind of conversations, both with people, stakeholders, uh, but you know, you're working with how many different jurisdictions and <laughs> types of people? How do you have some of those conversations? Um, so I would say we are regional in scope, and we need to make arguments for major investments, and, and data is always in there really important and, and having that health data, the data that already exists about the gaps between life expectancy is just an incredibly powerful way to talk about equity to an audience that does not necessarily get equity. It, it really takes all these discussions that may seem abstract and, and, and makes it real and, and you know, regional planning is a practice that's driven by numbers and, and that's a number, it's really, really hard to argue with. So I find it very powerful and I think um, the fourth regional plan has four subject areas, two of them kind of value areas, 
to our prosperity and sustainability, which are purely standards of money, but to our health and equity, and, and they really go together, or at least you know, separated them for these purposes, and it couldn't have happened without each other reinforcing. Um, but I think in the long term, we need to insist that our institutions, not just foundations, but our institutions, our governments, actually make space for those conversations to come. That it is their job, and we lost track of that. We have this fabulous planning process that's very theoretical, and doesn't, I know it doesn't really happen here, but it happens in California. I don't know how civic engagement <laughs> rates in California. I have some questions about that. But we really need to be in, you know, insisting to have that up. Mm -hmm. I would just say that it's important to listen, uh, have compassion, understand what you bring to the table, and know that you can learn from community residents. So I'm a professor of community development, and whenever I go into a community, it's to listen. I can say, yes, there's some things like, whether it be GIS or surveying, I can do that, data analysis, but you have to be able to define the problem. And having traveled uh, many to many communities around the world, there's something they all have in common. They want to be treated with dignity, they want human rights, they want to be free of violence. Uh, and then oftentimes they hear people say, oh, they don't want to invest in this. I've never met a community that doesn't want to invest in. What they want is to be at the table to determine what that investment looks like in their community. And it varies from community to community. What they don't want is a one-size-fits-all, uh, let's just, you know, a Starbucks here and this thing. But no, they, they have their idea of what economic development means for them, what community development means. And being a professor of urban planning, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have some skill sets that I can bring to the table but I think the most important thing of all I try to teach my students is to listen, to think about uh, what people are saying, to be humble, have humility, and you know, don't think that you can solve all the problems, but you can bring something to the table and together uh, with residents, with institutions, and others, you might be able to solve some problems. That's really great, and I, I think um the conversation about what an institution does or the university do does get to that point about kind of connecting to, to people and really ethics, right? So we're all in the same profession is, is one idea, but then I think the ethical responsibility for our different types of practice, our different types of ways of working with communities is really uh, important. So this sort of thread about kind of valuing conversations, valuing what, what people know that you don't know, <laughs> uh, right? Valuing the responsibility to kind of do the research, to uh, kind of make the connections that, that people may not have access to, uh, especially in some of uh, the most uh, needed communities. Um, so I did want to leave enough time to have the conversation be with the room. Uh, to, to illustrate that point. <laughs> um, so uh, I think if we have some questions. Uh, uh, I, I'm a lot older than any of you. Uh, and you know, Professor Coburn, I, I, I heard almost your identical lecture in the 1960s, surrounding the war and poverty and, uh, and the great society. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everybody knows that you gotta get people to talk to each other and all that. But, what we were never able to get past, and I mean, I, mean, I find it very discouraging, and now I'm pretty depressed to begin with, um, uh, is that we haven't learned anything over all these decades. Uh, um, this, this country does not believe in planning. Uh, Europe it believes in national planning, in Germany or in France, but we don't believe in that here. Uh, uh, land use planning is done by real estate developers. It's, the, the role of the New York City Planning Department is minor. Uh, 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 and, and it has always been that way. Uh, when, a, when, a, when a kid grows up in the Brownsvilles or the Bedford Stuyvesants or the East New York, uh, a, a poor kid, he realizes by the age of 10 that his life chances are zero. And so he starts looking around his neighborhood to see who's making it and who's making it are the hustlers. Uh, it has always been that way. You've, had, you've, you've contributed nothing new to this discussion, uh, at least from my you know, reading of the literature and, and my decades of uh, dealing with public policy issues. Uh, we don't even have uh, a comprehensive plan of conservation and development in this city. Uh, and so you know, planning is done in a, in a, in a random, chaotic way. Uh, one question I would like to ask the health people here. One percent of the, of the uh, uh, physicians associated with your clinics got their training outside of this country, in Mexico or the South America, the Caribbean, and all that. 
Uh, do you know that? So your question is, what percentage of physicians practicing in the U.S. have gotten their No, practice, the practicing in your clinics. So, so New York State Health Foundation doesn't have clinics. We're, we're a statewide health foundation that funds. Uh, all right. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, the sorry, clinics sorry, that, that no, deal with poor people. What percentage? What, no. Have you got sorry, a sorry, sorry, that? What percentage? Um, other questions? Yeah. I, um, I think uh, Jason alluded to the various traumas that are in a lot of these neighborhoods that you work in particular. And I wonder, what's the role of mental health and health equity? What does it look like as far as deliver uh, deliverables and tracking uh, increases or decreases in mental health? Yeah. <laughs> good, specific, good question. Um, it's, it's definitely important and in terms of the idea of toxic stress. Um, you know, it, it's often an outcome of those stressors. Uh, and, and so I think what we need to do is stop separating, you know, mental health from chronic disease, from um, community opportunity and uh, education and all the rest of it, and begin to see these things uh, from a more kind of preventative public health approach rather than uh, just treating individuals, which is important. People need that support, they need that counseling, they need that, you know, initial trauma uh, recovery. Uh, but like we're trying to do in Richmond, is also uh, include place-based opportunities, include economic opportunities, include um, you know trying to get at some of those broader uh, stressors across uh, the life, the people's lives that contribute to uh, poor mental health. So it's not to ignore, but to, it's to move away from just an individual-focused kind of treatment approach, and to combine that with this trauma-informed community development strategy. Uh, yeah. I, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add that in, uh, I also work in New York City government, and it, it has been an incredible priority of the current administration, uh, especially the leadership of uh, the First Lady of the City, uh, Sean McRae, and actually uh, just this week, a, uh, an executive director in charge of the Thrive NYC program, which is the city's kind of comprehensive mental health program that is a cross-agency interdisciplinary Inter, uh, uh, sector approach that working with in government, with non-profit uh, groups, and really at the community level, and to start building the institutions, building the conversations of, around mental health, becoming a part of the decision-making process and the, the, the doing business of the city. So I think more and more people are recognizing the importance and value and the um, kind of connections it has to a lot of different factors for what government does, right? Whether it's our supportive housing and dealing with homelessness or uh, environmental considerations as well. Yeah, and we've been stressing mental health big and small throughout, but I'd say one, one reason the key priority for us has been performing the process of planning in the fourth regional plan has been because the process of planning itself, if performed, could be a vehicle to build connections within communities. We have a lot of models. I think everything Jason talks about is really a model for that. Um, and that's one of, but that's actually a really good reason to invest in it, I would say, just on its own. So I've, been, I've been experienced working with youth in areas that experience lots of violence, and I can tell you that they, they, they suffer from a lot of trauma. Um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, even in areas where there's lots of development that's happened in neighborhoods, they, they also suffer from trauma. So what I found, especially with the young people, is that uh, the role of community organizations, places where they can go, so I have a former student now who's at doing a residency at Yale, and she looked at post-traumatic stress disorder among youth in Soba. And we were working at an organization called Youth Uprising that was providing uh, a number of services for young people between the ages of 13 and 24. And through this study, uh, what she found is that it not only helped, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, young people with their mental health challenges they're facing, but especially for women. Because what we found in the community is women, if they walk down the street, they're often harassed or don't feel safe. If they're at home, they have a burden of taking care of children and doing all these other things. The community center was the one place that they could go to and have some kind of uh, safe, feel safe, have a group you know, that they can, they can relate to and be counseling. And so she's done wonderful work. Her name is Tanya Majumder. She's at uh, Yale Medical uh, School doing wonderful work in Sarah. Do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. I, have a, I have a question for uh, Professor Foreman. I'm interested in the case of Natalie. And as I, we know that the community, 
we know the community is uh, uh, dynamic, so uh, ha how to deal with the community mobility for the, for example, the health of migration for uh, for foreign foreigners coming and local residents moving out to another environment because we need to guarantee uh, have equity not only for local residents but also for foreign uh, migration coming in. Yeah, yeah. So the important dynamic in all communities there is some movement, although we know that there's uh, limited residential mobility often for folks uh, often because of things like racial residential segregation. And even in Medellin, uh, there is clearly some segregation, for sure. Um, th this is also the importance of planning, I would argue, that we need not just neighborhood and community scale strategies, but also citywide and even regional strategies um, for inclusive neighborhoods. We talked a lot about, you know, and I've focused uh, probably too much on, on uh, the interventions and strategies needed in, in uh, lower income uh, communities that are already vulnerable. But we need, also need to highlight the high wealth, already privileged places and open them up in the same way as to opportunity for affordability for more people uh, for breaking down segregation. And that's what they've tried to do in Medellin with their integrated plan. Uh, they have a very uh, focused plan about uh, integrated housing and, and your kind of social class in buildings. Uh, in parts of, of the community. So it's an imperfect strategy, but it's really attentive to both the racial segregation and the class segregation uh, in both high wealth and low income communities. Um, you had a question? Yeah, I see the need to connect the dot here. Um, and that is that um, about five years ago, the New York State Health Foundation funded a study that showed that social inequality so-called social determinants of health, wound up filling emergency rooms and hospital beds in that one year to the tune of $3 billion. Mm -hmm. And so the, the state of New York started reversing itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we have now is what we may call a revolution of transformation. It's in the early stages. Mm -hmm. Mind-body paradigm is different terminology is used, but the mind-body paradigm uh, is emerging in the medical model. It's called integrated primary care behavioral health. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of movement. And then the last comment, um, and I was a former graduate here of uh, the School of Architecture and Planning and School of Public Health. Uh, the last comment is um, that's sort of a severe response by the gentleman uh, who spoke recently. Um, <coughs> Uh, but you do see extraordinary movement. Like, I'm in the South Bronx, and so you have a community coalition called Adams Point, Longwood Coalition, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, began emerging uh, from institutions, um, and it's um, looking at precisely not to repeat. Um, mm -hmm. We're not quite where you are. We'd love to have you as a speaker, uh, but we're moving in that direction where we're attempting to solve this question uh, while still being overwhelmed because gentrification is moving rapidly. Mm -hmm. People are being displaced in senior housing uh, in the South Bronx, so we have to constantly be vigilant uh, and, and mobilizing the community planning board and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. But there is that movement uh, mm -hmm. that's taking place uh, at, at the community level, at the micro world level. Yeah, I, I think your comments are, are really important to remember the, the momentum and the motion that we move towards. Um, we were actually just talking about this just before. You're absolutely right in terms of um, thinking through the social determinants of health and what that means for healthcare providers. And there's this movement right now in terms of um, you know healthcare providers when they are actually seeing patients, they they have to track um, diagnoses through CPT codes, right? So that's what they actually build to insurances. There's actually this movement now to think about social determinants of health measures or social determinants of health uh, indicators as Z codes. So are there ways that, that physicians and practitioners can start tracking those things so that when um, a patient is going from physician to physician or is coming back um, for exams, that it is already highlighted that there is either domestic, uh, domestic abuse or um, uh, a threat of eviction or things like that, and that it actually is being coded, so institutionalized within the health system rather than just within the medical notes. So thank you for bringing that up. 
So we established the Public Health Council. It's four years old. We haven't quite figured it out, but that's, <laughs> that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. We have an annual prevention plan, and we're trying to figure out how to spread out uh, and not just look at the issue of clinical. Mm -hmm. right. Great. Mm -hmm. Hi. My name's Catherine Ellington, and I am so glad I think I got to see you. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I think I followed all of your work. I'm a native. Uh, before medical school, I worked in community development, and I find myself with sort of unfinished business in terms of training because I'm like, I'm not really, th there seems to be a lot of new conversation to have as we try to shape healthier whole cities to have whole people, right? And so, as someone, I appreciate you, you know, no, I went, so I went to medical school abroad, I spent work, I did missions work in Africa, so I've been to all these places and I'm trying to think about place matters, but I'm also, uh, I, two things, there's an editorial by Paul Rogan in the Boston Globe about Boston and inequality, and as you build this technical city, it, as you shape the new innovative city, how uh, still the same people are closed out of the conversation as maybe 60 years ago. Um, and yet, there is, I feel like we're on the edge of something very new. Because I ask myself now, well, where do I want to live? Do I want to live in a house? Or, you know, where do I? So I'm having the conversation within myself. But I wanted you all to try to Posit, you know, because one of my things about the West Coast, so I just told you I went to medical school in a foreign country, and when I got out to the West Coast, I'm like, why am I lost? I'm from New York, I should be able to do this. But you helped me so much. But inequality means different things in different places. Mm -hmm. um, there's the local conversation that you have, there's historical racism, there's contemporary nuances to racism, that as we build, I'm going to be about building. I don't think I can, I really don't think there are things we can tear down, but I think we can build, we can shape, we can do, you know, that's how my engine is working. So I wanted you all to be able to really speak to inequality. And if I add my last two cents, as I move through the new and old neighborhoods in New York City, sometimes I'm saying with large scale development, I was like, well, at least it's happening last because. The public housing is already built. There's some middle housing, and now they want to build a large-scale building, so it's kind of in reverse. And and for people who, you know, the thing about local people in the video you showed some people who had never left Richmond. I spent a lot of my time with people just trying to get them to go down to the World Trade Center and look out for window. So talk about some inequality tools, tools to help us think about the gap. So, always so wonderful to see you. Thank you yes. for, for participating in our conversation, always. Um, so, I'll say that, you know, the reason why the New York State Health Foundation is in the neighborhoods that we are in is because these are neighborhoods that have suffered decades of um, racist policies, historical injustices, and medical apartheid. So, that's just baseline, right? Um, tools, to, tools to overcome, tools to build. So I will uh, give a shout out to the University of Orange that's in the room right now. Um, I will say full disclaimer, uh, I am both a board member of the University of Orange and uh, prior to my being at the New York State Health Foundation, University of Orange uh, was funded to support Niagara Falls in thinking through their organizing strategy. Uh, but University of Orange put together, I want to say about three or two years ago, as the foundation, in conjunction with uh, Columbia's uh, Center for Epidemiology, or Epidemiology Department within the School of Public Health, thinking about the health effects of gentrification and displacement. Um, and they put together a video called The Domino, the Domino Effect, uh, which is on Vimeo, you can Google it, it is a eight minute, 30 seconds video that walks through the historical injustices uh, and leaves, uh, leaves the, the moment open for community conversation in terms of what is next. So I think in terms of off the top of my head, uh, a really solid tool is a community screening of the domino effect with a conversation around uh, what folks can work together towards. And 
if I can tackle that from sort of a longer term policy. I mean, we need, you know, we need to invest in, in, in council, we need to invest in sort of in the existing housing. There's, there's a lot of money and policy tools that we know we can deploy, but we're not deploying them. And so, so first of all, having the health sector at the table at every point in this discussion, um, being there, being in another alley, ally and talking about it. And then specifically, jumping on a really successful model of supportive housing units and where quantifying the impacts on you know, the most extreme cases of homelessness and people coming in and out of uh, emergency rooms actually managed to move policy. So what else can we quantify so that you can actually convince the people who need to make fiscal decisions that this is a worth investment, which we all know it's worth, worth investment, but uh, you know, the more resources you can mobilize, the more chances of success we have. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add a point, which is that design is a very important one of those tools, right? So imagining a different future is a really critical kind of tool and, and strategy, I think, that, that communities can use more, uh, that a lot of communities don't really have access to. And so finding ways for our institutions, our kind of interdisciplinary network, to bring the idea of kind of creation and visioning uh, to, to people that often don't have access to it is a really important uh, next step that I think people are starting to pay attention to. Hi, thank you. My name is Marianne. I work for Yorkers for Parks here in the city. And I, uh, I know we've been talking a lot about listening to communities and letting communities lead um, the work that we do. And of course, as I'm sure you know, communities aren't always monolithic. And there may be many different opinions within a community, however you define it. Um, and I was wondering if you could offer some thoughts uh, or experiences on how you balance or prioritize among all these uh, competing voices. Well, I can speak. That's all. That's all. Oh, I can speak to that as a professor of community development. I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, when you're working with any kind of community work, there are lots of different opinions and voices, and you're never going to reach consensus. But I think it's okay, that's the time as a uh, professional, you can say, well, how we, we should look at what's happened in the X neighborhood somewhere else. You, there are plenty of good examples around the world that we can draw upon. And even if they're just inspiration to say, well, that's not exactly what this particular community wants, but there are elements that we can bring in. And one of the things that I think, uh, as I've learned through my own work, is the word compromise. Oftentimes, many communities do not want to compromise. And I think part of democracy is incorporating people in the process, thinking of ways to incorporate people in the process. So if you think about all the technological innovations we've made, and yet we still have plenty of meetings at the same time, there are all those acronyms. We, we could do so much more in terms of incorporating people in the process, starting with young people all the way up to the elderly, right? So I think that um, it's important to, to help with the visioning process. It's important to bring people along through the process to being transparent accountable, um, you know, responsible, all those things are, are incredibly important in the planning process. Uh, and you just can't get, out, get caught up in the paralysis of analysis either. And at some point you have to say, we have to make a decision. Not everyone's going to be happy with that decision. But I think if you go through a, 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 the best process as possible, and that varies by community, but try, you know, as long as you're accountable, transparent, and responsible, I think you can try to come up with something that's uh, better. And then, you know, over time you can, shift things around, I think the political park in Richmond, you know, how it first started out, and then it got tagged the next day, and then incorporating the community and young people into the process, it really does start to make a big difference, so. I, if I can just add to that, I've actually found in my experience that even within the planning world, where supposedly we're supposed to know what the process is, um, there is uh, a lot of skepticism that, or, you know, there's a lot of recognition that some people are just really good at creating the community process, and, there's often lack of kind of consulting these people in practice in the field, and then you have a bad process and poor outcomes, and everybody wonders what went wrong. It was actually the process that was flawed. So, really paying attention to that um, is critical. Okay. Um, I think we're short on time. Do you have one more question? Maybe we can just take two quick questions okay. and we'll try to wrap up. Hi, my name is Leah Eden. I come from a food policy background, really focusing on um, increasing equitable access to uh, healthy and affordable food. 
one of the things that I think is most interesting um, in our space is these unconventional partnerships where food groups are talking to healthcare groups, food groups are talking to affordable housing groups, food groups are talking to veterans. And I'm wondering from your experiences if you've seen any um, examples of really kind of promising like unconventional partnerships under this health equity space. Well, we can take the second question. Hi, I'm Cecile. I'm a medical student from the Bronx, and I'm going to be starting as a physician there soon. I was just wondering, you're talking about the doctor program about the ethics in um, aesthetics. And I was wondering, in the process of uh, building all these social urbanism and projects in many, how did they decide to bypass a lot of like more on the ground basic like necessities, like shelter and access to like more basic infrastructure like electricity and water and build these more massive projects that built a lot of pride into the communities, but at the same time kind of didn't address some of their more basic needs. How did they make that compromise and that sacrifice? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two good questions. Um, I mean maybe one response for, particularly for this second question in Medellin, they were very unconventional partnerships, at least for there, where you had uh, a utility company and community organizations and women uh, gender rights groups and others uh, focusing on what to ha what to prioritize in communities. There's a whole story that I didn't tell because of time that there was a, um, a 10 year investment already in some core infrastructure in many communities. So 90 plus percent had water, sewer, electricity. Um, the part I didn't say, which is not a successful part of this story, is they didn't do a lot of work around uh, housing and upgrading housing. That's still a challenge that they're working on now and other uh, um, people raised that issue. So it's, it, it, in any place, it's an incomplete process getting back to, hey, we thought we, we had this solved or a model in the 60s or whenever it was. Um, it's incomplete, which means we need to continue to have sharp attention uh, to the work, to who's included, who's excluded, what projects are counting, what partnerships are built, what institutions are or aren't changing, what inequalities and uh, privilege is being addressed or not addressed along the way. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not thinking about this as project work or one-off events or we're done and let's move on to the next community, but figuring out how to have a sustained, deep commitment that integrates issues, that integrates partners, uh, that tracks, you know, is it working and for whom? And if not, what do we change? Who else do we need to include? Whose voice isn't being heard, maybe in the in the uh, in the community or in the partnership, and are we also doing this work at the right scale? So um, community is one thing, but we also need the city and, and and larger scale interventions for this to really have the impact that it needs to have uh, long term. Sure. Um, so I think the idea of the the unconventional partnerships or unique partnerships. The, the question I ask is um, for whom, right? So for me, the fact that um, the New York State Health Foundation has its core funding in Niagara Falls with a 501c3 uh, that is primarily a resident-led organization that has no real paid staff that got its status maybe six months before we gave them their initial grant. For me, that makes the most sense, right? Because those are folks who got together who knew what health meant for them in their neighborhood, who knew that their neighborhood was being disinvested in while Niagara Falls was being heavily invested in as a tourist destination, and they wanted to do something about it, right? For New York State Health Foundation, as a foundation that comes from insurance money, who primarily focuses on healthcare, that is an unconventional partnership, right? Um, so I think th the question is for who, right? Um, but I think going back to um, our colleague at uh, New Yorkers for Parks. By thinking about um, the space and the place over a period of time, and I think Jason, you mentioned something along this line, that it's not thinking about the project, but you're thinking about the space and place over the trajectory of time, you're able to layer the work uh, one on top of another, and you're able to start having that work speak to each other. So our core funding going to a community-based resident-led organization has then led to partnerships with the city, has then led to partnerships with the university, has then led to part larger organizations who, if you were to think 
about it traditionally would have been the, the grant seeker and kind of the traditional grantee. But starting from a very different place, you're able to reach consensus in a different way because you're starting to think about bringing more and more folks to the table and thinking about it because we have the luxury of having a five-year initiative, which is very rare for foundations, right? Um, and to be thinking about focusing on a neighborhood for five years plus allows us to say, we may not get it right in the first year, and we may not be funding the right people in the first year, but we can build off of that in year two, year three, and year four. So um, I think that would be our, our last uh, sort of series of questions. I did want to obviously thank uh, this wonderful panel um, for all of their, their insights, and really uh, to, to all of you for contributing to this conversation. Uh, I think this is really the start of building uh, these kind of connections and unconventional links and institutions, and so we encourage all of you to kind of connect and network uh, to, to do that work as well. So, uh, thank you um, all for uh, convening this.